Looking forward to being with you again in the service tonight. Had a hard job to leave the parsonage this morning. The roast was cooking, and <clears throat> but uh, we're going to get there after a while. Praise the Lord. I love the Lord this morning. It's good to be around the sister trail. Amen. We always love coming to be with them, and you folks here in Taymouth. This place we go in Ontario every summer. Not every summer, but Tamworth. Always sometimes get them mixed up, but the Lord gets nothing mixed up. Amen. What an amazing God. He saves us. He keeps us. He provides for us. He heals bodies. He works miracles. He works signs and wonders. Amen. Brings people out of the world that are bound by all sorts of habits. They come to an altar, whether it's in the church or in their house, and kneel down and pray, and God sets them free, and people look at them and say, what in the world happened to that person? He never changes. Never. You say, oh, they, God couldn't save me. He couldn't save my neighbor. Oh, yes, he can. He saved you. There's no big sinners and little sinners. No big lies and little lies. We were all sinners. And he took care of the sin question. The Bible said he came once and for all. Amen. It said The Bible said for this purpose the Son of God was manifest he might destroy the works of the devil. And he's still the same. Amen. Hallelujah. Eight verse, the third chapter of Genesis. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to me, to be with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. That's still going on today. Everybody blaming everybody else for what happened. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Eve started something. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And I want to preach on three words this morning from the ninth chapter, or the ninth verse, the last three words of that verse. And when God asked Adam the question, where art thou? And I want to preach this morning for just a little bit. Where art thou? Amen. You may be seated. 1976, we were pastoring in North Bay, Ontario, and uh, lost my mom. 1969, a tragic car accident, so every winter that we could, we'd come home and make Christmas for my father up in Harvard County and place, little place called Clearview, the place where we lived. I call it Mohawk Hill. There was three or four families up on that hill, and we weren't the best people in the world. So we started at, we were passing North Bay, and so Sunday night after church, we started for New Brunswick, and uh, we left North Bay. It was a beautiful night. Moon was out. You could drive without the headlights on the car. We got to Ottawa, and the wind was blowing a little bit. Got to Montreal, and the wind was blowing a lot. Got halfway between Montreal and Quebec City, and it started snowing. And my wife decided she was going to sleep a little while. Got to Quebec City, and it was white out, and it was just coming and going. My wife woke up and said, why are you going so slow? I said, well, if you can't see where you're going, you just can't keep traveling down the road. Got to Montmagny, and the, um, the QPP was there. No, was that the provincial police were across the road with the car and put us off the road. We sat there for 12 hours, and the wind was blowing, and it was snowing, and just terrible. Called my brother and told him that we were held up. We wouldn't be home for some time. And finally, at 7 o'clock that night, they let us go back on the road, and we got to uh, Riviera de Lou, and I called my brother, and my brother said, where are you? And I told him where I was. That was physically. Adam, or God asked Adam the question, where art thou? And I know it was a physical location, but I want to preach this morning for just a little while on another avenue of where they were. 
where they were spiritually. God knew where Adam and Eve was. He really did. But he wanted them to respond. And God knows where we are today because he's God. I thought as I was praying in the church this morning, you know, we, we do serve an amazing God. God is a spirit. He's everywhere. He's in China today. He's in Africa today. He's in Europe today. He's everywhere. God is a spirit. And so God knows where we are. But uh, he asked Adam and Eve this question or asked Adam this question, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, well, you know, I hid myself. And so the Lord said, well, why did you hid yourself? And he said, hide yourself. And he said, well, I was naked and I hid myself. And so the Lord said, who told thee that thou was naked? I was thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And then, of course, you know, like we always do, we want to blame somebody else for what happened. I feel sorry. I, this is, I feel sorry sometimes for the devil, but I don't. But when somebody does something dev- something bad, you know what they say? The devil made me do it. We need to point the mic back at yourself and say, I'm the devil. <laughs> Amen. It was me that did it. It wasn't the devil that made me do it. But that's just the way humanity is. We want to blame everybody else for our mistakes and that, you know, they, they caused me to do this. And so... God was talking to Adam, and he wanted to know Adam where he was physically, but I believe also God wanted Adam to know where he was spiritually. And you know, our life is a journey. I remember one time, had an uncle that lived in Ottawa. He was the fourth from the top in all of Canada, in Canada Customs, and he said, you know, really, we're born to die. That's not very encouraging, but we really are. From the time that uh, a seed is conceived in the mother's womb until the time that that person takes their final breath, they're really born to die. Amen. The songwriter said, I was born to die until Jesus came. And Jesus said, I am come to bring them life, and not only life more, but life more abundantly. So we are on a journey from earth to glory. The world don't want to face this. The world doesn't want to uh, own up to the fact. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, it is appointed to man once to die and after this, the judgment. Nobody likes judgment. Nobody. I remember one time when I was a child, I got a sled for Christmas and you had this, we lived on a farm and there was down over the hill and down another hill and down to the main road and then up another road, and my aunt lived up there, an uncle or my uncle and aunt, another uncle and aunt lived just up there, and so I'm just a little kid, maybe six years old, so I decided in the morning I'm going to get on my my uh, sled and slide down the hill. Never told my mother and father what I was doing, and so I slid down the hill and went to my uncle's place, and they weren't even up yet, so the neighbors were, lived on the other side of the road, so into their house, and I sat there for a long time, and just now my sister come to find out where I was and got me. I got back to the house, and my mother really, you know what she did? <laughs> you younger folks might not know, but uh, <laughs> I know what she did. And I'm laying on the little old couch we had in the living room. I'm crying, and my dad comes in from the barn, looks in, I can see his face yet, looks in around the door into the living room and said, uh, you know, you got just what you deserved. You got the judgment. Nobody likes judgment. The Bible says it's appointed a man wants to die. And so life is not a joke this morning. Life is very serious. And I really think that when Adam, when God asked Adam the question, where are you? God wanted Adam to think, hey, you know what? Uh, God is really trying to reach me here. God is really trying to find out where I'm really at. And there's only two individuals that know this morning who you're really, where you really are. And that's you and God. And you can't pull the wool over God's eyes. You can pull over your neighbor and you can pull over your friend and you can pull over your husband's eyes or your wife's eyes, but you cannot pull the wool over God's eyes because God knows all things. I'll never forget one time, and I've ever told this year or not, but one time when I was in Horace in the church and my dad had an old 51 Ford and I wanted the car to go to the drive-in theater in Fort Fairfield on Saturday night. And uh, 
So I asked Dad, can I have the car to go to Perth? And he said to me, don't take the car across the lines. And I said, no, I'm not going. Well, I was lying. I wasn't saved, though, okay? I was lying. I, that's why I wanted the car. I wanted to go across to the drive-in theater. So I go to the drive-in theater, and, you know, when you live on a farm, 6 o'clock in the morning, the, the cows have to be milked. Whether you get to bed at 2 or 3, it doesn't make any difference. So I'm in the barn milking, and my, there was eight cows on one side of the barn and three on the other, and my dad would milk those three first and come down, and I'm on the, the first, the eight, and he comes in the barn, and he looks at me, and he says, I thought I told you not to go to the drive-in theater last night. And I thought, this is before cell phones. And I thought, how does my father know that I was at the drive-in theater last night? So I said to him, how do you know I went to the drive-in theater last night? He said, I didn't, but I do now. So fathers know more than you think they know. <clears throat> Where are you? Where were you? What were you? What were you doing here? And so here's God places Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he tells them, you know, you can eat of everything of the garden except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I remember when you were a kid, your mother and father said, don't eat the snow. How many ate it? How many remembers, don't put your tongue on the little round thing on the sled when you're thirsty? How many did? Yeah, talk about electric weld. <laughs> There was electric well before they had an electric welder. But Adam, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so here they are. They're in the Garden of Eden. It had, they had dominion over all of the animals. They had dominion over all the fish and the fowl of the air. Amen. They had dominion over every living thing. And the most wonderful thing they had was communion with God that had the one that had created them from the dust of the ground, and there was only one thing in Adam and Eve's life that they couldn't partake of, and that was a tree in the midst of the garden, and the devil come along and said, you know what, you need to eat of that tree. You know, that's sort of crazy. You know that? They've got the whole world in their hand. Adam and Eve had the whole world in their hand, and there was only one thing they couldn't have, and that's the thing that the devil come to them and said, you know what, God doesn't want you to do it. I mean, they had a beautiful home. There was no weeds. There was no dandelions. There was no thistles. There was no thorns. Everything was perfect. When you go to weed your garden, thank Eve. When you plant a field of barley and sow thistle grows in it, thank Eve. I'm not against women. I'm just telling you what happened. Amen. Amen. That's what happened. They disobeyed. Amen. God put them out of the garden. What a beautiful paradise they had. I want to tell you something this morning. God wants the best for his creation. I believe that. I don't believe that God wants people to be dope addicts and alcoholics and, and dope fiends and harlots and prostitutes and bank robbers and, and murders and all of that. God doesn't want that. God wants his creation to have the very best. Amen. And that's the reason that God touches lives and touches hearts and people are delivered from sin and brought back into fellowship with God because of His wonderful love and mercy that we sung about in this service this morning. And God comes along to them. Amen. And then, like I said, there's only one thing they couldn't do. And when they'd done it, amen, they eventually were driven out of the garden. And they hid themselves because they did not want God to know where they were. And you know something this morning, when we are brought face to face with God, whether it is by His word or by His voice or, or by His presence, He asks us the question, where are you? I'm the one that created you. I'm the one that gave you life. I'm the one that gave you eyes that can see. I'm the one that gave you a tongue that can speak. I'm the one that gave you ears that can hear. Amen. Where are you? Where is my praise? Where is my worship? Hallelujah. The world thinks we're crazy, and we know they're crazy. Amen. A while ago, I read some of the people, they go to hockey games and baseball games, and they pay sometimes hundreds and even thousands of dollars for tickets. 
just to get into this game. You think it's hard to pay your tithes. Those guys don't. Amen. And you know what? They go and play, they, they pay big money to go to those games, and they have no idea who's going to win. I know who's going to win. The Lord's going to win. You say the devil's got doing a lot of upsetting in the world. Doesn't make any difference. God's going to win. I read the back of the book. I know who's going to win. Amen. He's going to have a church. He's going to have a people that are redeemed by his blood and filled with his presence and baptized in his name, walking with him. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Oh, he's wonderful. He's all powerful this morning. But sometimes God comes along to us and says, where are you in this race of life? Where are you in relationship to me? Do you love me? Will you serve me? Will you give your life to me unreservedly? Will you commit your life to me? And we're living in a very, very fast-moving world. You saw that happen when Trump was elected as President of the United States. And the reason everybody's upset, this is my take, the reason everybody's upset in the United States about Trump is because he's not doing things like everybody else did them. That's what it is. He's shaking them up. <laughs> he's, dra- what do you call it, draining the swamp. Well, he can afford to. He's a billionaire. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but he's shaking the thing up. But sometimes... And we are living, I shouldn't say that, but we are living in a very, very fast pace of life. You know, we got cell phones and they know where we are all the time. I said something to my daughter and all you that I said, why is it on my crazy phone when I get in Fredericton and my wife's in Fabricville and I pull my phone out and it says you're an hour and 45 minutes away from work. You ever have that happen? What can they do to shut this stupid thing off? They know where you are all the time. And we're living in this world that is so uh, so uh, caught up in technology and all of that. But I want to tell you something. There is still the simple gospel message. There is still the simple message that one day God's going to bring this world into judgment. And so God sends preachers along. God sends pastors along. God sends Sunday school teachers along. Amen. To talk to people and say, what about your soul? What about your relationship with God? Where are you in God's time clock? Where are you in God's plan? I'm glad one day I walked to an altar in 149 Nelson Street in Brantford, Ontario and kneeled on my knees to an altar and repented of my sins, was baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you, but even these last 52 years, there's been times in my life when God has come to me as one of his children and said, where are you? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing for my cause? What are you doing, Amen, for my for my work in this world? And so, when the presence of God comes into our hearts, and when the presence of God moves upon our lives and moves into the church service, what do we feel like? Do we feel like hiding? Our youngest grandson was home one time off a deputation, and he hated loud noises. And so, I was vacuuming in the house, and he hid behind the sofa. I said, what in the world are you doing behind the sofa? He was scared of loud noises. Where are you? What's going on? Why are you there? Where are you? Or when we come into the presence of God and come into church, wherever it is, and God talks to us and God calls out to us, do we feel like hiding ourselves? Do we feel like lifting our hands? sin, you gave me life. One day when I was no good, you made something out of my life. You cleaned my mouth up. You cleaned my mind up. You cleaned my heart up. Amen. So I want to give you praise and I want to give you worship and I want to live for you because you died for me. So I'm going to live for you. I'm going to give my life to you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you. I'm going to lift you up. Praise God. Adam and Eve started out okay, but uh, somewhere along the line, Amen. God had to search for them and pronounce judgment upon their lives. And we could, I don't have time this morning, but we could go through the word of Almighty God. Saul, that was the first king of Israel. Amen. Saul started outright. But Saul 
refused to obey the voice of the prophet. And when Saul refused to obey the voice of the prophet, amen, God was saying to him, where are you, Saul? What are you doing here? Why are you down here? Why are you offering this offering, this burnt offering? It's not your place. And, and when Samuel came along, and after they had sent, sent them to smite the Malachites, and, and, so, and, and Samuel said, destroy everything, all of the cattle, all of everybody, destroy them all. And when, Saul, when Samuel came down to Saul, and Saul said, I have done the will of the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen? What God was really trying to say, amen, to Saul is, Saul, you're somewhere you should not be. You've done something that you should not have done. And so can't you really see that God is trying to say to you, Saul, where are you really? Where are you really? What's going on? What about your relationship with God? And God has asked us all the question many, many times. It was the same as King Ahab. He looked out the window one day and he wanted, what was it, Naboth's vineyard. And then he went, and he went down to Naboth and Naboth said, I'm not going to sell it to you. This is the inheritance of my father's and my grandfather, my great-grandfather. So I'm not giving it to you. So Naboth, or no, uh, Ahab went home sulking a grown man, like a little baby, an old Jezebel, I mean, the yeah, old Jezebel, young girl she was. What's the trouble, dear? I want to buy that vineyard. He won't sell it to me. Well, I'll get it for you. So she got a bunch of false people, and they lied on Naboth, and they put him to death. So Naboth, or Ahab goes down to take Naboth's vineyard, and the prophet of God comes along. He was saying to Ahab, what are you doing here? Where are you? Where are you, Ahab? Don't you realize you've taken possession of something that should not be yours? In fact, not only have you taken possession, you've committed murder. And you killed somebody. Where are you? But Naboth never did hear the voice of Almighty God. It's like when Naaman came down to, was it Elisha? And he prayed for him. And Naaman wanted to give the prophet of God a bunch of money and stuff. And Gehazi, yeah, wanted to give him a whole bunch of money. And he said, no. So Naaman left. And Gehazi ran after him. Oh, yeah, the master changed his mind. <laughs> Lying devil. No, he changed his mind. So he got all this stuff. He goes back to the prophet and says, praise the Lord, prophet. The prophet said, uh, where are you, boy? Where were you? Oh, well, I, was, I was just running here and there, you know. And the prophet said, uh, no, no. He said, when you went, my heart went with you. He said, is this a time to receive money and things and clothes and garments? And what he was trying to say to Gehazi, Gehazi, where are you? And we need to ask ourselves a question sometimes, where, where, where are we? David had the same problem. I know David's man after God's own heart, but, you know, he was so humble. He, he didn't slay Saul, and he was man after God's own heart. He's anointed king. He, he brings the ark back to Jerusalem. Then one day he gets up on the roof of the house. He sees a woman bathing. And God spoke to David and said, where are you, boy? Don't you realize you're going to be a murderer? Where are you? And you know something? It is so sad sometimes to hear David committed murder and, and all of this. But David, after a while, David was different than the rest of these guys. Because after a while, David eventually repented and asked God to forgive him. And so the voice of God comes to us. Amen. Where are you, Solomon? What, what, what is happening with you? Where are you? Don't you realize and don't you, didn't you read in the Word of God where it said that if you're going to be a king, you don't need 700 wives? Why would any man want 700 wives and 300 concubines? He must have been a billionaire. He would have to be. Come on, man. Are you scared to say amen? Amen. He'd have to be a billionaire to support all those women. 
But you know something? When God began to speak to him, what he was saying to Solomon, Solomon, where are you? You know the requirements of a king. Not very many horses, not many wives, not gold, not silver. What does it say? That Solomon made gold in Jerusalem like stones? Billions. Of, if he had lived today, if that was today, he would have been worth billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars. And God comes along and says, where are you? That's what happened to Cornelius. He was, he was a religious man. Cornelius paid his tithe. He wasn't baptized in Jesus' name. He didn't have the Holy Ghost. And the Lord came along one day and said, Cornelius, I want you to send for Joppa for a man, man named Peter. What God was saying to Cornelius is, Cornelius, where are you? Peter went down, preached to him. The Bible said while Peter preached the word, the Holy Ghost fell. They talked in tongues. Took him out and baptized him in Jesus' name. What are you doing? Where are you, Cornelius? And Cornelius said, we're here to hear you. Whatever you got to say, I'm ready to do it. Amen. I'm seeking after God. And I want to tell you something this morning, church. I pray every day for Quebec. I pray, oh, God, those people, they're praying to images that cannot hear. They cannot see. They've never healed anybody. Amen. Amen. They cannot walk. They cannot talk. They cannot feel emotion. And I pray, oh God, as they pray to you in sincerity, would you reveal yourself to the people of Quebec of who you really are? And not only them, but people around the world. Where are you? Where are you? And you know, when Paul went to Ephesus, he went to the disciples of John, and he said, if you receive the Holy Ghost and ye believe, you know what he was saying to them? Where are you in this spiritual journey? Where are you in your relationship with God? Where are you walking? Praise the Lord. And you know what John the Baptist disciple said? We have not so much as heard if there be any Holy Ghost. And he went back and he said, okay, how were you baptized? And they said, we were baptized under John's baptism. And he said, John baptized under repentance. And said, there's one coming after me that's mightier than I. He's going to baptize you the Holy Ghost and fire. And the Bible said, amen, he baptized him in Jesus' name. And when Paul laid his hands upon those people... At Ephesus, they received the Holy Ghost and spoken tongues. Praise God. Amen. What God was saying to them through Paul the Apostle is where are you in your religious journey? Where are you in your journey through life? Amen. Would you let me touch you? Amen. Would you let me speak to you? Would you let me work a miracle in your life? That's the God you worship this morning. That's the God we sung to in this service this morning. And God comes by sometimes and says, where are you? And you're the only one that can answer the question. Pastor Trail Camp, Sister Trail Camp, we might, they might think they know where you are. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner. But only God knows where you are this morning. Only God knows in you where your relationship is with Him. Can you imagine how God must have felt? When he went to the garden and Adam wouldn't answer him, he created Adam. He created Adam and Eve. And they're the only one. And God comes down, they're hid. Hidden. They're hidden. God wanted to fellowship. He wanted to talk to them, just like he does with you and I. And so God comes by sometimes. He might even call your name. I remember when I said, God talked to me. He said, Harold, can you just be here tonight, brother? You've lived in sin for 18 years now. It's time either you give your life to me or else you're going to have problems. And I'll never forget the night. I prayed, oh, God, if you let me live till morning, I'll give my life to you. God was saying, where are you, Harold? I created you for my glory. I created you to worship me, not to go to dances and drink liquor and smoke cigarettes and curse and swear and tell dirty stories. I didn't create you for that. I created you to worship me. Hallelujah. And that's why he created you, folks. He created you to live for him. And there's no better life. You say, well, Brother Kenny, there's people, die. There's people that are baptized, you didn't feel those that are dying of cancer and all kinds of trouble. You know what? We live on planet Earth. 
But still, God comes by to us and asks us the question, where are you? Will you follow me? Will you give your life to me? Will you surrender your will to my will? And the Lord comes and talks to us and says, I want to be your Savior. I want to touch you. I want you to be one of my children. Where are you, son? Where are you? In your life, from birth until death, where are you? And the Lord comes by and says, I love you. I want to gather you. I died for you when you were drowning in sin. And I say this statement. If I had been the only sinner in the world, Jesus still would have went to Calvary for justice. Because I want to tell you something, folks. Whether you're a billionaire or a trillionaire or a poppy or a pauper, God still loves a soul. And when God looks at people, He don't look at their financial status. He doesn't look at where they are in the community. They're just a soul. And God comes down and says, I want to touch you. I want to work a miracle in your life. I'm a miracle. Brother Trail's a miracle. Sister Trail's a miracle. And any of you folks here that have experienced God in your life and the way of salvation, you are a miracle. God comes to me still sometimes and asks me where I am. Because in this fast-paced life, it is the devil's business, saints, to get our eyes off of where we're going and to see everything goes on around us. But there's still a thing called the catching away of the bride of Christ. There's still such a thing as the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ when he comes back for his people, and I want to be ready. And that's why God comes by many times and says, where are you? You haven't read my word lately. You haven't lifted your hand lately and said, I love you, Jesus. Where are you? Where art thou, Adam? He should have hid himself. And oh, let me tell you something. And I got to quit. I want to tell you something this morning. When I walk into church, I don't want God to have to ask me, where are you? I want something to be in my heart and soul. It says, Jesus, here I am. I'm a product of your love and mercy and your salvation. You will not have to beg me to worship you because of what you've done in my life. And God's coming by this morning one more time to all of us and saying, where are you today? Can we stand? Father, we're thankful today for your blessings. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My sister-in-law's father Ralph Hansen. For 27 years, his wife went to church all by herself. Pulled the kids to church on hand sleds and the toboggans. Ralph never went to church. 27 years later, Brother Cooley was preaching in Perth Andover, a weekend or special meetings. And uh, Ralph said on Sunday afternoon, he said, uh, I believe it was Sunday afternoon, he said, Paul didn't want to go to church. And he wouldn't go. He said, I don't like crowds. A Sunday afternoon, he said, 
Pauline, is, is my suit ready? And she said, no, Ralph, it's not, but it will be just in a few minutes. Ralph went to church. Brother Cooley preached that night. and He felt go to talk to Ralph after he preached and get the altar call. He said, Mr. Hanscom, would you go to the altar tonight? He said, if you'll go, I'll go with you. I'll, I'll, I'll go pray with you. Ralph Hanscom went to the altar, repented of his sins, was baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And when he died, it was just a few months short of 27 years that he'd been in the church. His wife went 27 years without him. And when that preacher preached that night, the Lord said, Ralph, where are you? I'm here, ready to forgive you, ready to wash away your sins. I want to tell you something, folks. This thing is real. This thing is real. And God asked us the question today, where are you? Amen. Could we sing? And can we just come and maybe stand at the altar this morning or kneel, whatever you want to do? Maybe God has talked to you this morning. And he's asking you the question, where are you? I'm ready. I'm ready to fill you with my presence. I'm ready to forgive your sins. I'm ready to wash them away if you get down the waters of baptism in Jesus' name. I'm ready. And God calls to us. And we're the only ones that can answer. I can't answer for Brother Trail. Brother Trail can't answer for me. And God says, where are you? Praise God.